Hey folks, this is Jake Davis, and today is my 36th birthday. I'm getting old, and I like it. I tell you, 36 ain't that bad, man. 30s aren't that bad. 30s are damn sure better than my 20s were. Let me tell you that much. Wife and kids got me all these, well, not all of them, of course, but they got me some new, some cool new additions to my set here. Most, most notably the Pennywise. And Freddy Krueger back there. Nice. Nice. I like it. I like it a lot. Anyhow, today I'm doing something different. I um, uh, had several different top five videos I've been trying to work on. But quite frankly, I just kind of just... I didn't break down and force myself to do the work in time for the deadline a lot of myself. So I still want to do those videos. But they ain't going to get to you when I wanted them to. But, you know, hopefully we'll get a nice little string of retro... Of top five videos that y'all actually want to see. And we'll watch. <laughs> If you want. I don't care. Anyhow, uh, today what I'm going to do is this uh, a weird thing. It was my birthday, as I said. And so I decided to say, fuck it. I'm going to be super lazy. I'm just going to chill out. I'm going to veg out. And I'm going to binge watch some uh, free horror movies on streaming today. And that's what I did. Sat down for a good seven hours or so. Did not a goddamn thing. And I watched myself about five. Yeah, five. I don't know how long I sat down then. I watched five full-length horror movies for free on Amazon Prime. Uh, so I just, I'm just going to do some quick retro reviews. So we're going to do a retro review horror movie box set here. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, my only thing that I was looking for, I was looking for horror movies I uh, hadn't seen in a while. Uh, but definitely ones I had seen and certainly ones I didn't own a physical copy of. So let's get into it. These are videos, this video, however, is going to have spoilers. I will have a list of what movies I'm going to talk about in my descriptions. So check that out if you don't want spoilers. And again, I, I don't care though. So first up to bat is Hatchet 2. Hatchet 2 picks up right after the events of the original Hatchet. This is directed by Adam Green, starring Daniel Harris, Tony Todd, Kane Hodder. Uh, I feel like I'm missing somebody here. Uh, I love the Hatchet movies. All fucking four of them. I can't wait for James, he's, James A. Janice to cover them on the kill count because that's, he's going to he's gonna need a sponsor for those episodes. Uh, the whole setup here, it's, 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 a, it's a banded swamp in, in, outside New Orleans. Uh, and uh, Victor Crowley is a ghost of a horribly tormented boy that grew up around there and died tragically. And just anybody who goes in those woods don't just get murdered. They get comically murdered. I mean brutally murdered in the most severe, savage, horrific way imaginable. But it's so over the top, it's all kind of played for last, especially since none of these characters in the whole franchise are really likable in any way. It's a, it's, it's a unique, weird series. Uh, feels like all the budget goes into the cast and the effects. And it really feels like they shot this whole thing on their, like, grandma's... Uh, backyard something. They have lots of trees back here, so let's just go shoot there. <laughs> uh, like I said, picks up right after the events of the first movie, and uh, where the girl, the main girl, sole survivor of the event, she wants to uh, get a hunting party out to go out there, but she gets Tony Todd to go with her. Tony Todd uh, basically is a sleazy fucker. His name is Reverend Zombie. <laughs> He figures if they can basically feed the, 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 the people responsible for Crowley's death to the ghost, that the ghost will go away, and um, he could then make a fortune out of having tourism, tourism uh, trips go through here. Uh, of course, his entire hunting party gets brutally massacred one by one, just helpless sons of bitches. Uh, I mean, like, there's a guy who gets killed with a belt sander. It's, it's, it's rough. Um, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, Tony Todd gets killed. Uh, but this, even though Victor Crowley cannot be killed, cannot be stopped, this movie does end with a kind of satisfactory, uh, the last few shots. And you see Danielle Harris chopping up his skull and blowing his brains out. At least stops him, slows him off and out. Slows him down enough for her to get away, uh, until part three. <laughs> next, bat, next up on the menu is Bats from 1999. Oh, one more thing about Hatchet 2. It came out in 2010, and of the four Hatchet films, it was the only thing, only one that was released theatrically. 
It's funny to me that the sequel is the only one that came out in theaters. It's usually, you know, the other way around. Especially with horror movies. Up next is Bats from 1999, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, Dana Meyer, Leon, and movie's greatest piece of shit, Bob Gunn. He has never, ever played anything but a douchebag, lowlife motherfucker in a movie. Ever. It's his whole career. Um, <laughs> the whole setup to this is... A lab, ha the government has created some genetically mutated giant super bats, super smart bats, and uh, vicious predators, uh, and they've contaminated and, like, <laughs> colonized all the local bats. Now they're terroriz terrorizing this town in Texas, so they have to bring in this, uh, this, um, uh, bat, batologist who, you know, just, of course, has to be a hot redhead that could, that should, should play Batgirl. And uh, Lou Diamond Phillips, the sheriff, the two of them have to work together. I love how it's it's a it's a government operate. The government's responsible for fucking up this whole thing, but it's just all down to the sheriff and the science bat chick. <laughs> it's funny. It's really funny. I actually love this terrible fucking movie. It's kind of like Gremlins meets Jurassic Park, but it actually tries to go for more scares than actual laughs, even though it has some funny bits. Leon plays a typical. Uh, 90s comic relief token black guy, but he's at least funny in it, you know. Has a few cringe moments. Has some cool monster scenes, even though uh, they do try to go for more practical. It's puppet bats and not just all CGI, even though there's definitely some CGI in there. Uh, it's really fun. I love this movie. Uh, it all breaks down, of course, that the government um, uh, released them to see how they could evolve and adapt. They track him down to some damn lab, to some damn caves, uh, freeze him to hibernate him, and then blow him up. Great post-credits, uh, right before the credits scene, you know, all horror movies have the tease for the sequel. You see one bat got away, and then he instantly gets run over by a truck. That's great. I've always loved that. That's funny as hell. Of course, there was no two bats, too. There's no reason for bats, too. And, you know, as far as Lou Diamond Phillips goes, he's always just been a really good actor, as far as I'm concerned. He's the kind of guy that could just be given the worst fucking dialogue and just sound so natural and charismatic, letting that dog shit slip off his tongue. Uh, up next was The Stuff from 1985, directed by Larry Cohen, I believe, starring Michael Moriarty and uh, uh, Garrett Morris, uh, Paul Servino, and uh, Danny Aiello. I will deal with this one. <laughs> is uh, uh, they, they, they find some bubbling white crew in the, in the snow, and they start marketing this shit because it's all sweet and tasty and damn near addictive. So um, uh, Michael Moore is replacing ice cream as the top is the top um, <laughs> uh, dessert in the world. So, uh, so corporate sabotage is called it. So that's where Michael Moriarty comes in. He's investigating it. Finds out it wasn't really researched. It wasn't really tested. And hunts down to the, the town that it was originally found. And basically everybody there is a pod person. Once again, kind of, and the stuff is alive. And the more you eat it, the more it consumes you. And kind of uses your body as a vessel kind of thing. Once again, uh, mixing in... Uh, sci-fi genres from the 50s, much similar to Bat's Dead, but, you know, not the 50s. Uh, but, you know, mixing the blob with body snatchers, and Larry Cohn's work is just, you know, look this guy up. It's some crazy shit. Uh, Michael Moriarty's character is really weird. It's like, despite all this crazy shit going on, he never really seems rattled, scared, or surprised about anything. Uh... It's a trip of a movie, some really wild effects. There's a kid who figures out that the stuff is killing people and is taking over his family, has some cool stuff going on there. Eventually the kid and the, the investigator, they all get together, and they find this crazy son of a bitch who's basically Alex Jones with his own personal army, and they use his, his radio station to broadcast and tell the whole world that the stuff is evil and that it's monstrous and we got to stop it. Which is great. It only really takes to one broadcast, which is so funny compared to modern times, where it doesn't matter how many broadcasts, how many videos, how many analysts, how many reports, no, how many times, no, how many, m many times, how many people dissect a story to expose something that was corrupt. People still voted for Joe Biden. Anyhow, <laughs> the movie ends with um, uh, uh, Michael Moriarty at gunpoint. Forcing the fuckers who originally uh, packaged and distributed it in the first place to eat their shit until they basically become uh, stuff pods. Stuffies. 
As Horgar, he calls him in the movie. It's a trip of a movie, man. I loved it. Up next was from 1999, 1997, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Starring, directed by Jim Gillespie, starring Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and that's really all you need to know. Whew! Fine women. Uh, I mean, this is the only one I'd seen at the theaters, but like I said, it's been many, many years since I'd seen it. I wasn't really a fan of it when it first came out. I do, uh, I'm kind of a little bit more appreciative of it watching it now. I don't know if I really would straight up recommend it. Because it seems like some of those movies, if you're a horror movie fan, if you're into slashers, you're going to come across it eventually. It's not as gory as I remembered it being. Uh, actually, not really gory at all. Kind of thing. They could probably have just about gotten away with a PG-13. Was it PG-13? Shit, it may have been. I don't think it was. Uh, I, I thought gender, uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar's character was more, far more interesting, sympathetic, and a better performance than I remembered her really being. Going from this uh, beauty pageant queen who's got her whole life ahead of her to just being this really, from this one incident, beaten down and um, insecure, scared woman for the rest of the film. Uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, of course, had a huge crush on her my whole life. Maybe my biggest Hollywood starlet crush ever. Uh, what I've always liked about the movies, uh, Ryan Phillippe is really good in it, and I think the photography is terrific. The whole setup here is sh on 4th of July, shortly uh, around, you know, around graduation time, you know, with a whole life ahead of them. Four teenagers get drunk driving on the mountainside, run over a fisherman. Uh, they decide to save themselves. They dump the body, and a year later, they're, all their lives are really in the shit. They don't kind of aimless at the moment. And they start getting these letters, these threats, telling them that some that they know what they did last summer. Eventually, they're stopped, and people around them start dying. And it turns out it's the guy that they ran over, uh, survived, and he's after them. But the thing is, he wasn't, you know, he was there burying the body of a guy he had killed in the first place. Uh, the guy who had killed his daughter in drunk driving. So it's like, you know, every summer something horrible happens around here. So maybe y'all fuckers should just all move. <laughs> this is like a cursed town. <laughs> Especially around the 4th of July, apparently. Uh, eventually, uh, by the time Jennifer Love Hewitt figures this out, the, the, the fisherman has killed her friends, except for her old boyfriend, who now she thinks is a killer. She gets lured on the killer's boat. There's a big chase and a finale. Uh, eventually, uh... The fisherman gets his hand chopped off, thrown off the boat, and uh, presumed dead with a jump scare at the end to set up a sequel. Um, like I said, my problems with this movie is that the fisherman end up being just the guy that they ran over, and the whole film was kind of presented as a murder mystery who done it. Was was just it's so it's just it, it's it's the guy it's just the guy that they hit. So not only were they not murderers, they actually were civil servants because they were guy they found this is vigilantism. <laughs> they would have been better off if they went to the cops the whole time. <laughs> but, you know, I just kind of felt the movie was always a bit of a cop-out towards the end that these characters did do a horrible thing, but by the reveal of who they killed, it just was, I don't know, just a cop-out to make them not be bad in the end. You know what I mean? And, eh, mm, horror movies should be about morality. And finally, Nightbreed. Uh, for 19, from 1990, one of the few films ever directed by Clive Barker, starring uh, wait a minute, Dermot Mulroney, I always get them mixed up there, <laughs> and uh, David Cronenberg, a few times he's ever acted in a movie, and he steals this fucking movie. Uh, the whole setup here is uh, Schaefer's character plays a guy named Boone. He's a mechanic, dating uh, a mu uh, rising musician, and... <clears throat> His, he becomes the head, um, the, uh, the the prime suspect in a series of serial, in a serial killer case. A guy who's been breaking into families' houses and wiping them out. Uh, turns out that his psychiatrist is the killer and has set him up and has been using hypnosis to try to get these ideas in his head. All at the same time, uh, Boone has been having dreams of this graveyard. He finally finds where the graveyard is and there's these monsters living there. Uh, he, while leaving, uh, the psychiatrist sets him up, gets him killed. He comes back from the dead, zombie style, and goes back to the graveyard. Uh, eventually, the serial killer and an insane, bloodthirsty, corrupt local sheriff decide they're going to go in there and just wipe out 
all of the monsters, the night breed. So it's no, it's the same, you know, with uh, the shape of water. You know, you see all the videos when that movie came out. All oh, the movie is so fucking awful. Then Patterson says, you know, we took this unique approach of experiment where we're going to make the monster the victim and the real villain is the people. Yeah, so did fucking Frankenstein, you moron. It is such. So sanctimonious. I hate that fucking movie. It won Best Picture. Best Picture. It wasn't even nominated. Anyhow, I love Nightbreed. Oh, and you know, it, it breaks down the killer, kills. It seems to just be slaughtering people all over this town without the sheriff knowing. <laughs> uh. Huge fight at the end. There's this. There's this demon god, and there's these rules. And basically, Buddha's the chosen one. He fights the breeder killer. He kills him and pills him after being impaled. But he can't be killed because he's already fucking dead. And he turns his girlfriend into a monster, and they're going to be the new leaders of the monster clan. Uh, it's really kind of fucking great, despite being super stupid and very, very over the top. Uh, there's, there's no hint of subtlety anywhere in this movie. Uh, but yeah, man, you gotta praise Cronenberg in this. Uh, not only is he, I mean, not only is the breeder killer in and of himself this really sick piece of shit, um... Uh, that's his whole deal. He kills families because he sees, he sees human existence itself as a as a as a cesspool. A cesspool it needs to be eradicated. Utter filth, filth contributing filth on top of filth to make filth. Oh, what a piece of shit! So yeah, you're happy to see him get killed. But even before he's killed as the breeder kill, revealed as the breeder killer, because there's so much weird shit going on. You, I mean, if you figure out, of course, he's the obvious. Obviously, he's a serial killer. But even before they establish there's a serial killer in the film, in his first scene, he's... I mean, Cronenberg is creepy, and it's really creepy. And Dr. Decker is just all around a solid villain in horror films. Really unappreciated one, considering he only is in the one movie. Anyhow, I hope y'all enjoyed this super pack. I uh, had a lot of fun. I, well, I don't know these... I mean, these were retro reviews. I'll probably put them in my retro review playlist and count them. Maybe I could just knock off five months just like that. Anyhow, I'm going to go enjoy my birthday, have a few drinks, and maybe something up. I'm Jake Davis, and I'll catch you on the fly.